Welcome for Visual Communication Tips for eLearning. I'm Diane Elkins with eLearning Uncovered. And today we will look at how, not just to be better graphic designers, but how to be better visual communications, starting with uh, visual communicators. Start with what it is and why it matters, and then some of the things that you can do to make sure that your eLearning has a, a higher level of visual communication. So what I'd like to do now is uh, share my screen and walk you through some of the information here. So let me get all set up. There we go, and put up chat so that I can see what everyone might have to say. So if you do have any questions along the way in chat, please feel free to chime in. So visual communication tips for e-learning. Let's start with uh, what visual communication is. Well, it's really exactly what it says. It is a form of communication that we do in a visual way. So it is not the same as verbal communication. It's not the same as me talking to you right now. It's not the same as um, narration coming across your e-learning course. It's how we can communicate in a visual way. And you can, um, you can s there are many aspects that go into it, everything from layout and animations to photos to characters to the fonts that you pick to the colors that you pick. Um, and all of these are going to lend to an extra layer of communication on top of what you are already doing with whatever words you might happen to have going on. So um, all of this can hopefully work together to create a unified message for your learner. And let me answer a quick question in here about chat, about the audio. Okay, great. So what do all, how do all of these things work together? Well, many of, many things that we think about when we look at communication is just how something looks in terms of whether or not it is appealing. So for example, we could have a course that looks like this, and that's going to uh, communicate one thing, or we could have that same course look more like this. Or we could go even to the next level and have the course look more like that. So in each case, it's all the same words and it's all the same um, type of images, but the message is different. The, what is communicated is different. So let's look first a little bit about methods. So let me put the, the kind of before and after in the up here at this on the slide together. So in chat, I'm curious, what about these two slides are different from a technique standpoint? What is it that makes the one of them rather hideous and what makes the other one a little bit more appealing? What are some of the techniques? Good, consistent graphics. So on this side, they're all a little bit different. We've got photos, we've got diagrams, we've got um, all sorts of, of different styles, whereas here it's a consistent look. Very good, we've got some others. A unified color scheme, yes, yeah, so here everything is different. We've got bright colors, we've got muted colors. Um, this slide is also more organized. Uh, here you don't really know where to look. Everything is fighting for your attention, and yet here it's a little bit more organized, and I think it conveys a sort of a juggling concept. She seems a little bit more in control, whereas here she's kind of juggling, but it's a little bit more chaotic. So it's, um, and then you've just got the, the stripes and the fonts, just too many things going on versus, in this case, simplicity. So that's a little bit about some of the techniques that are different. How would, you, what would you say is different about what they communicate? So in chat, for the first one, other than the, the, the literal message of seven ways to stay focused on your, your priorities, what does this slide sort of say to you? about the course and about the people who created it. So just some thoughts in chat. What's kind of communicated to you other than the, the literal message? I'm curious to see what you say there in chat. It's cartoonish, it's disorganized, 
Yep, I would agree with all of those things. It's kind of like a meta message. So the literal message is seven ways to stay focused on your priorities and you kind of have a sense of, oh, we might be talking about email and tasks and such. But it's, um, to me, part of what it communicates is, is also, like Ben says here, unprofessional, it's disorganized. To me, I'm even going to question the credibility of the content a little bit. I'm going to kind of wonder if the content is any good and I'm going to wonder whether or not I should even take this course. If I'll be honest, if I were to pull up a course and this was the title slide, I don't know that I would click that go button. I think I would probably click the X close button in the top corner of my browser. So there's a literal message and then there's a meta message and so we need to be thinking about that. Whereas what are some of the things that the blue slide says to you, the one on this slide? What are some of the things that it communicates to you? Let me, let me see what you think in chat. What are some of the things that this says to you? It's more organized, it's more focused, and it's kind of interesting that it's more focused, and focus is one of the topics, seven ways to stay focused on your priorities, and it's easier. It's easier to read, definitely. It's more interesting. Do I think I'm going to enjoy this course a little bit more? Uh, I would think so, and I think I'm likely to place a little bit more credibility into what I'm, what I'm learning. So how things look matters. And so I want you to think about how there's techniques that go into it, but then also the ultimate message. So thanks for your uh, input on that, everyone. So Graphic design is a big part of visual communication. So here's a little um, sort of um, evolution of a design. So we just got some fake text here and we could start with a very simple layout like you might have as a default in PowerPoint where we have a title, three bullets, and a picture off to the side. And by using graphic design elements, we can make it more visually appealing. So we could give it some color. I'm not so sure about that one. Okay, that helps a little bit with a nice frame. The heading now stands, stands out a little bit more and your eye is more drawn there and you can distinguish it better from the bullet points. Um, here we just have the, the image on the other side. We can make the bullets a little bit more interesting and eye-catching. We can make the images a little bit more interesting and we're focusing in more on her face and so we get that feeling about her a little bit more. We can add some color to it, match her shirt a little bit, add a drop shadow around the edges here and around the picture, um, add a little bit of transparency and an image in the background. And so we can do a really nice job of turning a slide like this into a, oops, into a slide that's more like this. And those are techniques around graphic design. And I like this definition that uh, many of you know Tim Slade, who used to be on our team, that um, graphic design is the art of moving things around the screen until they look good. And that matters. People form impressions. You formed impressions from those two different title slides. So graphic design and making things look good, it definitely matters. But it's not the whole picture. So let's say I do have this um, slide and it looks nice, but what if those aren't the right things to be saying? What, are, what if those aren't the right things to be emphasizing? I made it prettier, but what if it isn't the right thing? So let me share with you a slide from a course um, that we did with our sister company, Artisan eLearning. We did a course for the American Red Cross on a form. It's a form 5266. Really, you know, riveting stuff. It's a form, but it's a really important form. And we started with a webinar that they had that had very text-based, bullet-heavy slides. And so here's what it started out with. Is, uh, here's a little bit about what this form is. And it's a little uh, visually overwhelming. It's a little bit jarring. That red's a little bit too bright. I'm trying to make sense of all of the text while I'm listening to the instructor. So if I was keeping it either as a webinar or turning it into um, an e-learning course, I could apply just the graphic design and make it look nicer. 
So this slide definitely looks nicer. What is a Form 5266? Well, I'm talking to you, giving you the details, and these bullet points um, summarize that. So great, I have used graphic design to make this slide more visually appealing. But what if that's not the best approach to put that text there? So if I were to instead say, hey, this slide is about getting you to care about this form and why it's important to our organization. Could I do something like this instead? In the middle of a disaster relief operation, like Hurricane Matthew, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of volunteers that we have to coordinate, as well as equipment and supplies and logistics. And a lot of coordination has to go into the fact that the exact right supply has to be in the exact right place in the exact right time. And the Form 5266 helps make sure that happens. So is there a pretty big difference between that approach and the one you saw a minute ago with the bullet points? Even if the bullet points are pretty, are those bullet points the most compelling visual communication that we can put out there? And so that's why visual communication is more than just making something pretty. It's about making it the right visual method. Um, and yes, Winona, there would be some before and after slides that we would go into that do list the form. We'd probably then show the form briefly as well. So you bet, we would definitely want to tie some visuals into the form. So when we look at visual communication, it's not just what's on the slide, but what are we trying to do? Let me give you another example also from this same course. So here is a, um, uh, the before. So one of the things that they need to know about the form is the timeline. And basically the way it works is it's submitted daily and you would include everything up to that day at 5 p.m. and then you start collecting afterwards and it's due at 11.59 p.m. So I could have that slide or I could have this slide. I could say the form 5266 is filled out every day. But what does a day mean? A day means from 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. And so what that means is that if you feed somebody at 4.45 p.m., they'll be included on that day's form. But if you feed somebody at 6 o'clock p.m., they will not be included on that day's form. And the form is due at 11.59 p.m. So again, I could have made the previous points prettier, but in this case, I think you are more likely to absorb the information and remember the information. If I were to stop you on the street next week, I think you're more likely to remember that it's filled out every day and that the cutoff time is 5 p.m. That big list of bullets, even if it was pretty, is not going to be as memorable. It's not going to help you understand it and retain it. And so what that brings us to is the fact that visual communication for e-learning is more than just graphic design. It is definitely graphic design, but it is also information design and instructional design. We need to be thinking about all of these things when we are looking at our slides. So if we go back to what we had earlier, the slide I had earlier, Graphic design definitely includes your fonts and your graphs and tables and illustrations and your layout and your photos and your diagrams and all of that. Those are methods. One of the things we also need to look at is what is our communication goal? And so our goal might be to evoke an emotion or help the meaning become clearer or call people to action or help enhance our credibility. Visual communication is about using our design to accomplish goals, not just to make things prettier. So one of the things we need to do is really change our mindset when we're looking at visuals. So whether you're doing a PowerPoint for a classroom training, or perhaps you're doing a, um, a webinar, or you are doing e-learning, what is an unfortunately common approach is I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my content and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and I'm thinking and the question that comes to mind is, hey, what should my slides say? Or possibly, what should my bullets be? And then, what piece of decorative clip art should I put in the corner? 
And unfortunately, this is what a lot of corporate training is these days, is what should my slides say, what should my bullets be, and what piece of decorative clip art should I put in the corner? Well, text is not the most compelling solution in many cases. Um, text has value, I'm not anti-text, but unfortunately, I believe it's our education system has really kind of moved us away from pictures to words. You, you even think about it when you're a kid. What did you want to do? You wanted to draw pictures. Well, partially because it was easier when you were little. You didn't know how to read and write yet. But you also, when you wanted to read a story, it was the one with the pictures. Is we very fundamentally respond and process pictures better than even words. But then we learn to read and write, and the next thing you know, most of what we do in school is about the term paper and the essay question. And when you're doing a term paper, you're even rewarded on length. How many words can you get in there? And so we have learned to communicate primarily through words. But in reality, our minds process pictures so much better. And if you're interested in some of the research behind that, I really <clears throat> recommend a book by Ruth Colvin Clark. I'll put the uh, title here in chat. It's called Science and, oh, I'm sorry, I always do it backwards. It's called E-Learning and the Science of Instruction. I'm typing in chat for you now. And she just came out with a new um, edition of it, I think this past May. E-Learning and the Science of Instruction by Ruth Colvin Clark. I believe there's a co-author, but I can't ever remember his name. E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, where she goes into some of the reasons why. And one of the reasons is that while you're working at looking at words, that's using kind of one channel in your brain. But if you're looking at pictures, it's a it's kind of a different a channel. Not I don't know that that's not exactly the right biological psychological term, but it's a deeper processing when you're looking at both the visuals and the words. Um, and the pictures are much better at evoking emotion than words can be, and often better at conveying meaning. So instead of looking at it this way and saying, what should my slides say? What should my bullets be? What piece of decorative clip art should I put in the corner? Well, maybe here's what we need to be doing instead. Again, we're sitting there thinking and looking at our content, and we need to ask ourselves, what am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to accomplish with this slide? And then what visual will best help me get there? What am I trying to accomplish? And what visual will best help me get there? And if you start thinking in those terms and asking those questions, which should have a question mark at the end, um, <laughs> proofreading, you are going to have a different approach to your slides if you ask these questions instead of what should my bullets say. And you'll think very differently, you'll start seeing very differently, because whether in your PowerPoint, whether you're in Storyline, whether you're in Captivate, whether you're in Lectora, you start with a blank canvas on every slide. It can include whatever you want it to include. And so be thinking about what's going to be the best approach. So here are some tips to help you get there. The first thing is to make sure that you're really clear about what your point is. You can't answer those questions here if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, if you don't know what your teaching point is. And sometimes you have to really boil down something that's complex into its absolute essence. So here's an example from uh, Tim Slade. Is this was a design that he did early in his career for loss prevention. And it had lots of things on it. There were lots of ideas and lots of pieces of information and lots of graphics and really cool design techniques and some fun fonts. But in reality, there's so much noise, you're not going to see any of it. What's the point? If I were to glance at this, would I, the viewer, know what the point is? With this um, page is not just all of the fonts and the graphics and the turn sideways and all of that, but that it's not clear what the point is. Your design will never be better than your thinking. If your thinking isn't clear, your visuals won't be clear. And if your thinking isn't compelling, your visuals won't be as compelling. So this is going to be where it starts. What's the point of my slide? What am I trying to communicate? And so the, the revised version, yes, it definitely looks better from a graphic design standpoint, but it's also better from an information design standpoint. 
it has a, a much clearer message, a much smaller message, and it is more likely to get action because they're very clear on what they're trying to accomplish. Now let's translate this to those e-learning slides we looked at a minute ago. So we looked at this one about what is a form and why should we care. Well, if you look at this, we can boil down what's the real essence of this slide. What's the teaching point? Okay, so it's, okay, it's assessing progress, it's what has happened, it's a tool for reporting and capturing, it's the official record of activities. It's a critical report because it's an excellent management tool that can be used to make significant decisions. So what's the point of this slide? Well, personally, I feel like there's too many. There's too many points in one place, and they're not evolved enough in some cases. So for example, it's a critical report. It's an excellent management tool to make significant decisions. Well, are people just going to take our word for that? Can we just say it's critical and it'll be used to make significant decisions? Wouldn't it be better if we share what those decisions are? And that was kind of where the, um, the version it came from that I showed you is what are those significant decisions? What, what is the impact? And so uh, I think this slide uh, suffers from trying to accomplish too much and not doing it, any of it well. So if the goal in the point, I'm sorry, the point is, is some, are some of these details, I think we also need to look at the goal, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute. So then the one about the 5 p.m., again, if I look at this, what's my key teaching point? And if I could really boil it down to its essence, is the cutoffs at 5, and you submit it at 11.59. And this exception, we can handle elsewhere. That's more of a footnote. So it starts, you, you cut off at 5, you submit at 11.59. And in reality, when talking to the subject matter experts, those were the biggest performance issues as well. That's part of how you know your point, is what are people getting wrong on the job? What are they doing incorrectly? What are they misunderstanding? What are they going to their boss with questions about? And this was a big confusion point. And so I could have all of these words, but really what do I want them to walk away with? 5 p.m., 5 p.m., 5 p.m., 5 p.m., 5 p.m. That's what I want to be just drilled into their brain. And so a visual, even if all I did was make a massive 5 o'clock p.m. on the slide, I'd be better off than this because my point will be clear. It is clear what my point is. So that's your tip number one is to know your point. It seems kind of obvious, but it, it's not always. And then the second tip is to know your goal. So separate from your point, what is your goal? So getting back to this slide, I have my points about it to be important, but what's my goal? To get you to care. My goal is to get you to be willing to take this two-hour course on filling out a form. Yes, a two-hour course on filling out a form. But it's very complex. My goal is to also get you to care enough that if you are in that disaster relief situation, that you do it properly that in the middle of all of that chaos, you take the time to do it right, that getting it right is important. So I have my point, but I have my goal. And so if my goal is really to get you excited and to get you to care, this slide, even if made pretty, isn't going to get there. I need to take a different approach, potentially. Again, with this one, what is my goal is to get you to remember 5 p.m. Because it's not a difficult concept. There is nothing hard to understand on this slide. It's just about getting you to remember it cold. If I woke you up at 2 a.m. in the morning, you'd remember that it's 5 p.m. That's my goal. Let me look at another one here, another goal that's common. Uh, so, so those are some common things in instructional design is getting people to care, getting people to remember, getting people to understand something that's complex. Would a diagram make it simpler? Would a table make it simpler? rather than just a bunch of bullets. But another um, very useful instructional goal where your visual communication can help is get people picturing themselves in the situation. We know that adult learners are going to learn best when they know how something relates to them and they know how they'd use it in the real world. And so the more we can use our visual design to get them to picture them using this information and to picture the situations where it be, would be relevant, 
they're going to care more and they're going to remember it more and they're going to figure out how to apply it and you're going to get that training transfer. So here's a storyboard of a question for a course on the, for the Red Cross and a disaster shelter where our narration says we have a uniformed police officer and he shows you his badge and he says, hey, I'm with the sheriff's department and one of our suspects might be in your shelter. Can I see your records and walk around? And you have to, to figure out if you can is um, yes, you do it um, or no, you ask them to wait and get your supervisor. The uh, graphic suggestions, a lobby background and a police officer. So in this case, this is what the finished slide looks like. And so it's sort of that first person view is I'm looking at this as if I am sitting at the registration desk in the lobby of this high school, which is serving as the shelter, and up, up walks the sheriff. So I feel myself being in this situation. And here we do have audio in this course. So we have audio of a, a sheriff sounding guy. Uh, asking to see our records. And so that's another way your visual design can really help your learning goals is to get them to picture themselves in these situations. Now that's all well and good if you have a well written storyboard. So it kind of brings up sort of tip number three is which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first? well-written content that's engaging inherently and has clear graphic suggestions or does the visual design drive that? Where does that come from? And that's a really important question and my answer is both. Is that the person who writes the content needs to be thinking visually. The person writing the content needs to be telling a compelling story. Uh, because your hands are going to be somewhat tied if somebody else did the writing and the instructional design work and it's already been signed off before you get it. For example, you know, here there's a lot to work with. We've already got a scenario based question. We already have it in dialogue form. We already have suggestions for lobby background and a police officer. So in this case, it is not that hard to make this slide visually compelling. But what if you were given this? where the question was, are you allowed to share resident records with law enforcement officials? And your answers are yes, no, or only with the manager's permission. And they suggest, hey, why don't you put an image of a file folder off to the side of that question? Well, you could design that slide, but it's not going to be as compelling. It's not as compelling a question, and so the visuals are harder. So there is very much a chicken and the egg scenario here. So I'm curious, for those of you who are on the webinar, let me know in chat, are you the person who's just doing the writing side, just doing the building side, or you're doing both? So just the writing, just the building, or are you doing both? Let me see what you come up with. Great, so a lot of you are wearing both hats. So what I would encourage you to do is to begin thinking about graphic design and visual communication from the very, very beginning. Um, I, I, I'm a visual, my, my degree was actually in visual communication, so it's kind of my thing. And when I write storyboards, I'm constantly playing a movie in my head of what would this look like, what would this look like, what would this look like. And even if I'm not a graphic designer, if, you're, if I'm the one writing the storyboards, I've got to give my designer good raw materials. If I'm asking a boring question and if I'm thinking superficially and I'm not really thinking about scenarios and I'm not taking things to practical application and I'm not giving an example, it's going to be a lot harder for my graphic designer to make it compelling. And so your visual communication starts with your instructional design and your storyboard writing. One of the things I've done in the past, I've noticed, uh, when I was first in e-learning is I might write a little bit of conceptual information, some theoretical information, and then I'd give an example. And uh, for example, one of our clients is an association for people who manage homeowners associations. And uh, we did a course on them about, uh, for them about rules. So homeowners associations, it's one of the things they're kind of infamous for is all of the rules that they have. And so, um, we, we did some theory um, about how 
one of the things that makes a good rule is that, or two things that make a good rule. One is that they have a specific um, tie-in to the betterment of the community. Like there's a reason for the rule. And number two, that they're uniformly enforceable. And so uh, we explain those two concepts. And then the example was a lot of um, uh, homeowners associations, especially uh, high-rise buildings like condos, and, uh, have rules about pets and the size of pets. Like you can have um, a pet, you can have a, a cat, up to two cats, and you can have a dog, but no more than 40 pounds. And so if you apply it to those two rules, well, what's the betterment to the community? Does it, if, I'm, if I have a 45 pound dog, does that cause some undue burden? And, and what are we going to do? Are we going to have doggy weigh-ins? Is that how we're going to enforce it? Um, if I have a dog who's 38 pounds and then as she gets older gets a little bit porky and now she's 43 pounds, do I have to get rid of my dog? Or I can only, I mean, oops, um, apologize. I hit the key when I was gesturing. Um, so, um, and so I told, you know, told the story. And so when I go to design the slide, I start with the conceptual information about it being um, be of betterment to the community and it being enforceable. Well, during that paragraph or two of narration, there wasn't much for me to work with. You know, I'm like, betterment of enforcement. How do I visualize that? How do I, how do I, I, I don't even know. And then when I got to the example, oh, so many great ideas came into my head about how I could illustrate that example. So one of the things I've learned to do is give the example first. Start the slide with the example. Uh, and I think there's a value instructionally because then if you tell the example first, then when you give the theory, you kind of have an anchor for it. You go, oh, okay, I get it. I see how that those two rules matter. Whereas if you give the rules first theoretically, I'm trying to kind of go, okay, I understand the words you said, I'm not quite sure where you're going, I'll hang in there yet. So instructionally, the, having the example first can sometimes be very valuable. But visually speaking in e-learning, it is so much better if the example comes first because then I can start with those really compelling images. And then when it comes time to the theory, I can just bring up a panel that lists the two criteria. And it's a much more interesting slide. So instead, it would say, imagine you're in a community with a dog and blah, 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 and the doggy weigh-ins and all of that. This is a perfect example of the two main rules you need to know about rules. Rule number one, and then you go into the theory. And so remember, it may be thinking visually from the very beginning. First of all, have that example. Secondly, think about how it would work based on where it is in the slide, or I should say when it is in the slide. Now this is another example of where um, kind of that which, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. If my boss gave me all of this copy and said put it in a flyer, I can't just come back to him with this there's a very fundamental change in the message. So it's not just up to the graphic designer to go from here to here. It's not just the person who has InDesign who's doing the page layout. It has to be a collaborative effort between who's deciding what to say and how to say it. Okay, and again here, if I move from this slide here to the approach I showed you earlier, that involves completely rewriting the script. And if somebody has already written it and all of your clients have signed off on it, well, that's going to be a really hard change to make. Uh, so some people, if you're, wearing, if you're wearing both hats, be thinking about it up front. Some of you are just the person building. Well, maybe talk to the people who are writing the content. Have some brainstorming sessions with them. See if you can have input on an early draft. Because the earlier you can shape what is being said, the more you can make sure that you, ha you have the kind of raw materials that you need in order to get a good visual design. Okay, So I've got a couple of uh, sort of uh, summary tips here about your visual communication. One is you definitely want to use visual communication to help your learners see what you're saying. So you can have all the words you want in audio, and you can have a transcript down the side. And yes, I've got nothing against the three bullet points if they're going to be supporting what you're trying to say. 
if that's the best approach. But really ask them, what's going to help them see what you're saying? What's going to help them feel it? What's going to help them understand it? What's going to help them picture it in their mind? What's going to haunt them on the job? And yes, I said haunt. I want to haunt them. That's what I want to do with my training. I want it to be six months from now and they're sitting at their desk and they're in this situation and they're haunted by what they learned in the training and they're seeing that picture and going, oh yeah, I remember what to do here. I remember that from the training. So how can we get them to see it both during the training and then later when they're on the job? And use your visual communication techniques to help with that. Make visual communication a dedicated part of your entire e-learning development process. Um, some people use visual storyboarding. Um, at Artisan, our sister company, we tend to do more text-based storyboarding, but some people map things out and they sketch things out. Uh, and that's one approach to really make sure that you're thinking about the overall uh, visual message. And by the way, one of, this is, these techniques are good in the classroom, they're good for webinars, but I think they're more important for webinars and for e-learning because your slides are your entire visual. When you're in the classroom, you've got an instructor and the instructor is saying words. And yes, the right visual can make it so much easier to understand, but the instructor can just go white, uh, walk over to a flip chart or a whiteboard and sketch out a diagram to make something clearer if somebody doesn't understand it. Or they can gesture or, or kind of, you know, sort of explain something that way. So if the slides are boring, at least the instructor can be interesting. And in reality, that's what the students are looking at most of the time, is most of the time the students are not looking at the slides, they're looking at the instructor. And they're using the slides for reference. And hopefully they're still good slides. But in e-learning, all you have is your slides. And so it's going to be way more important that they are providing that engagement and that information as well. So make visual communication a dedicated part of your entire e-learning development process. Never storyboard anything you can't communicate visually. So if you're sitting down and you're looking at your storyboard and said, I, boy, I don't even know what I would put on that slide. I've got no ideas. Like on our, our template, there's a place for you to put graphic suggestions. And if you're going, hmm, I can't think of anything. Well, maybe ask yourself, is your point clear? Are you being theoretical? Are you being too abstract? Do you, should you be telling an example just for the value of the example? So it's a nice double check. Now I realize that not everybody is as good at thinking visually as other people and so sometimes it's okay to just sort of put it over to the other side of the fence when somebody else is doing it, but it could be a signal to maybe a, a larger flaw in the thinking. Remember that your, create, your visual creativity is going to start with good thinking. Have a clear point. Know what your point is. Know what your goal is from more of a, maybe an emotional or cognitive standpoint. So even if you can't draw a straight line with a ruler, it doesn't mean you can't think visually. Think like this was a movie. What's going to go, be going on? And so another way that you can enhance your visual communication in your course is to nurture your creativity every day. And so if this is a skill you want to build, well, I encourage you to research something called sketch noting or um, sometimes it's called uh, graphic facilitation or visual facilitation. And it's a method of um, taking notes where you're using pictures instead of words. And a lot of people hesitate, oh, but I can't draw. Well, can you draw a stick figure? Can you draw a star? Can you draw an arrow? Can you draw a box? Well then yes, you can probably do something like this. So I first studied some graphic facilitation about three or four years ago. I'd never even heard of it before, but I, a couple of people mentioned it in the same month and I'm like, okay, the world's trying to tell me that I should look into this. So I looked into it and I, right after that, I went to a conference, I think it was Technology, and I said, I'm going to try this. And so the notepad I brought to take notes, I tried very hard to not just write sentences down or bullet points down, but I thought, how could I um, sketch this out using stars and arrows and shapes and diagrams? And it was a really interesting activity for me. Um, and it helped me think more creatively. It helped me think more visually. And 
it also helped me realize when my when the presenter wasn't as organized because I, they'd say something and go, oh, it looks like we're going to learn a couple of points here. So I draw out like three or four boxes to put the points in, and then there weren't three or four points. I'm like, oh, that was not going where I thought it was. And so it helped me realize that a, an organized presentation was easier to sketch note than a disorganized. It's all about that thinking sort of a thing. So use visual communication to help your learners see what you're saying. Make it a part of your overall process. Never storyboard anything you can't communicate visually and do something to nurture your creativity every day, whether it's sketch noting the news or just looking at some samples of other e-learning. So with these visual communication tips, more than just graphic design, but also instructional design and information design, what questions can I answer? What questions can I answer to help you implement some of these techniques? I'll give you all a minute to type. I'll give you all a minute to type. While we're waiting for folks to type, just uh, wanted to let you know for some of our regulars out there that this November webinar is our last of the year. We're taking December off with the busy holiday schedule, and so be looking out for our website um, when um, to start back up in January. Winona, great question. How do you know how to draw the information out of the subject matter expert? That is, that is such a great question. Um, and some subject matter experts are awesome. They'll just, they, you just ask them a question and they'll talk for an hour and give you tons of great information. And some of them are very brief or they're very theoretical or they go through de too detailed. One of the best things um, that you can do is start asking, asking for examples. So if they share any information, say, oh, can you give me an example of that? And sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes they'll answer, sometimes they don't. So one of the things that I've learned when interviewing subject matter experts is you have to learn to ask the same question multiple ways in case, in case the first try doesn't work. Like maybe they'll give me an example, but it's really a superficial example, or it's more about them and how detailed they need it, but my audience needs it at a different level. So one of the questions I always do is I, I like to think about Joe. So who's Joe? Joe is some guy sitting in his office on some Tuesday in February, and he's facing a situation where he's going to need this information. What is that situation? What is Joe doing that's causing him to need this piece of information? And that's going to help your subject matter expert. First of all, it's just going to keep your content more focused. Um, it's going to help it keep it very practical in terms of application. So if, if subject matter experts have trouble giving me examples, I use that. And that usually helps get them warmed up. It also can help you negotiate out things that don't really matter to your student. Because if, if they can't think of an example of how Joe on the job on some Tuesday in February, what situation, what phone call did he just get? What conversation did he just have? What just came across his email that's going to cause him to need this? If they can't answer that question, then you aren't ready to write storyboards yet anyway. You've got to figure that out. And that's going to help keep things more organized. And then you can use that example as a scenario. The other thing that you can sometimes do is, um, is really look at the type of information. So maybe they just throw a ton of stuff at you. Is sometimes step back and look at it really big picture. Uh, we did a course for Catholic Relief Services on um, how to evaluate the effectiveness of a disaster relief operation. And it was on evaluation techniques. And one of the modules was on sampling. So if you're going to survey the 10,000 people affected by this disaster to find out the effectiveness, well, you're not going to survey all 10,000 people. So there's different approaches for sample size. And we had this whole module that talked about, OK, you do this one here, and you do this one here, but you only do this one in this situation. You might do it in this situation. So all of the information was there, but it was very convoluted. And I found that in my mind, I was going, well, you do this, if this, but only that. And then I thought, if then, if then. Oh, if then. That sounds like a decision tree. And so I went through the whole module again with that lens. And I was able to map out the whole thing as a single decision tree. And that became the core visual of the entire course. And it just made the whole thing easier to understand, because you could follow it along visually. 
And then there was another one about evaluation um, meetings, like you'd have a daily evaluation meeting and you'd have a monthly meeting and then you'd have an end of project lessons learned. And we had this whole set of story, we were, you know, we'd already written all the storyboards. And it, to me, I just read over them with a new perspective at a big picture and said, I just feel like we're throwing lots of facts at them. So here's a technique and here's six facts about it and here's a technique and here's six facts about it. And in my mind, I'm trying to do, make sense of them all. So how is this one different than that one? And I realized, oh, it's all about comparison. And what I realized is that for each of the techniques, we talked about who attended. For each technique, we asked, we mentioned the timeline. For each technique, we mentioned the goals. And what I realized is you could make a table that summarizes all of it. So down the side, here's the techniques. Across the top, here's your audience. Here's your goal. Here's your timeline. Here's your deliverable. And so we ended up making a visual that just organized all the content. It made it very easy to illustrate. It made it easier for them to understand. So in that case, they didn't provide those things. They provided the raw information. And I had to bring to the table, say, OK, I'm an outsider. And what I had to do is trust my own struggles. If I was struggling to go, well, how does this compare to that? Well, your students are going to wonder how this compares to that. OK, well, what are my different techniques for comparisons? Tables, uh, it, would a flow chart work? Would like a seesaw diagram work? So maybe turn your own struggles into what would help the student. I hope that helps, Winona. Um, the other technique that I use a ton is called action mapping. And it's by a woman by the name of, Ac of Kathy Moore. If you just do a search for action mapping, Kathy Moore. It's a great technique to help you coordinate your conversations with subject matter experts. It's not a visual communication technique per se, but if you use her technique, you are automatically thinking about practical application. You are automatically thinking about scenario-based questions. And if you're doing practical application and scenario-based questions, it's going to be a lot easier to do your visuals. So it's kind of like that chicken or egg thing, is design your course well, your visuals will be easier. Good. Any other questions? What else can I answer? Anything at all? Let me give you a minute to type. See if anybody has anything. Nope. OK. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I do really encourage you to start thinking differently about your slides and asking yourself, what am I trying to accomplish and what visual will help me get there? So thank you so much for attending and have a great day. Hey, did you like that video? Make sure to check out some of our other great content at elearningandcover.com.